everybody. My name is Gilda Ross. I'm the Glenbard Student and Community Projects Coordinator. Delighted that you could join me today for this very inspirational program. This is our topic tonight. We're going to hear from Dr. Michael Allen. Allen, we've been waiting two years for this night, and we couldn't be more excited. He has written this very inspirational book, Motherly Love, and he'll be talking to us this evening. This is a program that has been co-sponsored by the Glenbard Equity and Inclusion Committee and FUSE Families United in support of excellence and equity for all, especially students that identify as African-American or Black. As you know, everyone is welcome to every GPS program, whether you live in the neighborhood or whether you live around the country. Please, please, our ask of everyone is always to like us, uh, share the, in the information so others will come to these programs, which are free to all. Programming for uh, those who have young children, programming in Spanish. There really is something for everyone at GPS. Let's take a look at what's upcoming. Um, as you know, uh, we're proud that this is a kickoff to Black History Month. That will continue next week as well when we welcome back Julie Lycock Haynes. Julie has written truly the book on parenting. Um, it's, it's just uh, the number one resource uh, and bestseller, How to Raise an Adult. Uh, she will be with us this time to talk about her book, uh, Amer Real American, her memoir. That is next Tuesday on February 8th. It should be another very important and inspirational evening, uh, Black in White Spaces. We'll hear from Julie next Tuesday. Then we begin our Live Life Well Week programming. Kristen Neff, who is uh, one of the premier researchers on self-compassion, will join us on Wednesday, February 16th. The Power of Self-Compassion is the title uh, of her presentation at 7 p.m. The next day, Toby Scruggs Hussein will be talking about mindfulness for healing, we'll touch on equity as well, and self-care. Thursday, February 17th at at noon. So please do uh, let, let people know, and I hope you'll come back. Go to glenbardgps.org for the link. You saw all of the people who make the programming possible. Take a look at the brochure. You'll see all of the those organizations that support us on the front and on the back. Most importantly, you are here and uh, just couldn't be more excited. So uh, the format, uh, Stacy will introduce Dr. Michael Allen. Uh, we'll have some questions. Um, if you, some questions from students as well, please let us know if you have questions in the chat or the Q&A, and we'll be happy to take them afterwards. So Stacy, take it away. Hello. Uh, thank you so much. Dr. Michael Allen was named 2020 Elementary Principal of the Year. He has spent 14 years serving as principal at various schools in the Chicagoland area. He has taught countless current practicing school and district leaders how to effectively implement comprehensive mindfulness practices in their schools to strengthen their student-centered learning environments. In addition, he has served as a mentor, coach, and skilled researcher to various leaders and organizations specializing in emotional intelligence, equity, human resources, school improvement, and climate and culture. Dr. Allen recognized the huge need for reading materials that depict young Black boys in a manner that is authentic and relatable, as well as life-affirming. To that end, he and his brother co-authored the best-selling children's book, Brotherly Love. Michael tirelessly advocates to end policies that hold students of color down, so it was not surprising that he was the only school leader that contributed to the Inclusive Educate Education Act that Governor Pritzker uh, signed into law mandating the teaching of pre-enslavement Black history to all students in Illinois. He has been an instrumental leader in various think tanks across with North, Northwestern University, the University of Chicago, as well as Harvard University. Please help me welcome our esteemed speaker, Dr. Michael Allen. Good evening. Thank you so much, Stacey and Gilda. It's a tremendous honor and privilege to be with each of you. Uh, I am going to try my best to give you a bit of an experience rather than just a, a presentation of sorts. But I am very excited, uh, considering the fact that it's been a two-year build-up, right, Gilda? So uh, very excited to be able to share some, some of my experiences with you all and then to be able to engage uh, on the back end. So thank you. So I'm going to share my screen 
and try to walk us through um, our experience. So as we start off, uh, what I like centering and work with, um, and if you will indulge me for a second, um, those of you in the equity world are not new, new are not novices to this, but I do like centering anything that I do uh, as a man of color with first understanding the folks who come before me. So I want to do a land acknowledgement and just uh, make sure that we're clear that there are indigenous people on the land that we now occupy. Um, this, this particular land uh, as far north as, as, as the Glenbard area, but also uh, come back towards Evanston and Chicago was occupied by the Kickapoo, Peoria, Potawatomi, Miami, the three, the Council of Three Fires, and Monomi, um, among many other indigenous people. I think it's really important before we jump into things to kind of center ourselves, recognizing um, the ancestors who come before us and made tremendous sacrifices to be able to have us step into the opportunities we have today. Um, so having said that, uh, my house rules, I, I'm sorry I cannot break this habit yet. I am a career educator. So I always feel like it's important to kind of talk through um, the context, but nothing, nothing deep. Uh, but if you have not done so yet, please, please mute yourself or turn off your microphone. Um, there are going to be opportunities to to uh, talk through questions. So if you if you have that, I believe that feature is available. You can just dump those in the chat. And then finally, um, there'll be a, a team that will sort of support us at the back end of the, the presentation and walk through the Q&A portion. So. Our agenda is sort of defined by four to five key areas. So I like centering my, my sort of story, if you will, on the major defining life events. And there are three of them for me that helped me get to where I am today. Um, then I will sort of talk into where I've arrived and how I got to this pro-humanity piece and, and, and how that uh, connected to the book, Brotherly Love. The five keys to peace for me, um, the things that I've learned over the course of my life that I think are valuable uh, to maintaining um, stability and balance. And then finally wrap up with uh, the leadership principles and the implications that I feel that I've developed and not only tied to adults, but, but youth and, and any folks that any group of people that are seeking to try to empower vulnerable and marginalized people of all kinds. So having said that, uh, to jump right into things, I am um, born and raised in Waukegan, Illinois, uh, but I bounced around pretty regularly. So spent a good chunk of my childhood in the city just, just north of Waukegan uh, called Zion. Um, my siblings and I, there, there are uh, five of us. I'm the second oldest of five. Uh, we grew up in this area called the Hebron Projects and attended virtually every school in Zion before moving to, to Waukegan at the end of uh, elementary school for me. What's well, important to note, because I think it undergirds my foundation and, and sort of my, uh, my approach to equity work, is I was exposed to extreme tra trauma um, as a child, so much so that I, I actually repeated preschool. Uh, I didn't really have much memory of that until, until of late, but I think the, the trauma that I experienced in the household, some of which I'll be able to share in this space, um, is what uh, subjected me to that reality. Um, but my siblings and I like talking through, we were extremely poor, um, so much so that, you know, you took, if you look at the word poor and you drop the last two letters, we just poke. Um, but we spent many nights without water, without lights and food, and we experienced homelessness at various points in our life, and that was largely contributed to the fact that both of our parents had a pervasive uh, bout with uh, drug addiction over, over 20 plus years with it. So what I think is also important to note about me is I really don't have any memory of a life where, where people didn't consider me elite. So it started with me when I was about eight or nine years old, really the first time my mother came to me um, and, and, and uh, the drug addiction was starting to take over. She kind of gave me the responsibility to manage in a household from a financial perspective. And I was, uh, I was probably in the second or third grade at the time. Um, one thing that I like doing uh, as, as an educator, uh, particularly spending so much time with middle school, high school and, and elementary students is, is I'll center my work in a couple of short stories. So the first one that I like to share in this space is called Ham Hocks and Greens on a School Night. Um, and it kind of gives you a perspective as to, as to the reality of what my authentic experience was as a young person uh, growing up in extreme poverty and in trauma. So I'll jump in. Uh, it was an early winter night, well, be pa well past my bedtime. I'm the second as, of my family's five children, um, and I was seven years old at the time. It was cold, but there was not snow on the ground yet. The frost lined the seals of the windows of my family's upstairs three-bedroom apartment, just as it had uh, many, many times. Um, and every other day at that particular phase of life, my mom and my father were arguing. 
This time, though, in their room, my father was trying to take my mother's paycheck to buy drugs, as he had before. This was a different kind of night, though, because I could smell greens and ham hocks in the air during the school week, and that was rare. Abruptly, as it had been many times before, I could hear the unsteady thumping sounds from afar between my mother and my father in the room. My brother Brandon approached me and said, they fighting, they fighting, and he was doing his best to whisper. Suddenly, I could hear my mom's feet tapping on the floor as she bolted into the kitchen. My father followed behind her. Just as he went to hit her in the face, my mom poured the boiling greens and hot water onto my father's face. My father's scream was so loud and high-pitched that it pierced my eardrums. I will never forget the visual of his brown skin being replaced with the pink layer beneath it, as my sister Tasha, who was six years old at the time, helped him across the street to the fire station. That night, I learned that you could stop impromptu violence with calculated action, for that was the key to survival. So this is to give you a bit of a context as to where I was young. Um, as you can imagine, I continued in this pr perspective of, of, of kind of being this, this, um, this person who was rooted in excellence, and, and I, I would say an idea of Black excellence, um, and, and sort of always put into that role. But as you can imagine, from my younger days, I was captain of pretty much every sport or activity that I was on, in particular, um, whether organized or unorganized sports. Um, and I feel like I was pretty clear about that from that moment moving forward, that I wanted to do something special with my life. My friends called me a gangster nerd, which is, as you can see, I like illustrating this picture so you get a visual. This is me at 18 years old in high school at Waukegan. Um, and I think it'll give you the, the context of the duality for me. Um, on one hand, I was an honor student uh, with top five of my top five percent of my class, uh, pretty much all of my life. But at the same time, because of the different things I was dealing with outside of school and what I was exposed to younger, I was engaging in, 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 in physical violence regularly. Um, so much so that it, you know there are countless fights that I've been involved in, and I'm not sure people were were conscious after we ended them at different points in time. Just to give you a picture as to to where I was. And the complexities of my world, I, I like to capture that through a story that I call Brawling in the South Side. Um, so it's just another Saturday in Waukegan as I chill with my friend Randy at his house in his family's basement. Um, we were playing video games with my brother Brandon and, and his other friends, uh, Madden and 2K to be exact. Eventually, somebody suggested that we retaliate on this guy who we had beef with and fought two times before on their side of town. Only this time, we would have to go to the South Side which we weren't familiar with. For one of the few times in my life, I followed along and went with a plan that didn't make sense for me. We went to the party and without fail, got into a fight with the guy in his family's house. After the fight, we met back in the parking lot. Just as we started bragging about what happened, men who were much older, bigger and stronger than us stormed the lot and wanted to fight us. My crew and I fought until we had enough. By the time I left the lot, I had multiple dents in my car a broken driver's side window, a bump on the top of my head, and rage in my heart that nearly drove me to destruction. I saw my future flash before my eyes. That night at the age of 18, I learned that while my fist could pack a mighty blow, my mind was much stronger. So as you can see, uh, one of the things I took from me from that experience is I knew that there was a crossroads. Uh, I knew that night after that experience, the next morning in particular, that I, if I continued down that path, I would be involved in street life, um, and that would pretty much compromise the opportunities I had for college. So I decided to, uh, to, to stay serious and, and get focused more on college um, and ended up going to a small school in Indiana uh, called Valparaiso University, played football there, graduated in three and a half years. Um, what's important to know, which is what I like sharing, is one of my claim to fame is halfway through my sophomore year, um, I ended up getting a call with my youngest brother, who was a sophomore in high school at the time, about him being on the verge of dropping out of high school. His name is Gilbert. Um, and he was ineligible and he sort of was at a low point in life. Um, so I kind of tried to console him and told him if things got worse, uh, I would just come back home and grab him and take him to school with me. Um, little did I know things got worse. So I ended up having to go back home, uh, convinced my mother to, uh, sign over guardianship of him and brought him back to college with me and raised him for the next two and a half years. So we were from Waukegan and he's being raised in Valparaiso, Indiana, um, Porter County area, which is one of the more overt racist places in, in the Midwestern area. Um, and so there's so many different experiences that uh, we both endured together, uh, recognizing um, that he was, he was sort of going from being my brother to overnight my son. 
And so the pictures here just capture just the journey um, of where he went, uh, his climb. So he came, he came to me as a 10th grader reading at a third grade level. Math skills were similar. Um, he had a pretty intensive special education uh, plan or IEP, individualized education plan. But he was able to achieve his goal, go to college. I went to a small college in Indiana, uh, finished in four years with grades as good as mine, went on to uh, get a master's degree um, and so forth, and, and he's working on his doctorate. So for me, what I think is important to note, and I'll wrap up with my final story is, uh, many people don't know this about me, but I, my first year as principal, I was uh, 24 years old. Um, I really didn't know what I was doing. I, sometimes I'm just astounded by the fact that that's an opportunity to be, that I was presented with. But when I think back about what I was prepared for when I raised my brother in college, uh, it makes a lot more sense in the context of things. Um, the story, uh, No More Law and Order, I think captures sort of this issue that many people of color and, and, and folks in the BIPOC community deal with as we try to uh, advocate for vulnerable and marginalized people without realizing the impact that the system has had on us and how we can ultimately fall into oppressive roles and not realize it. So um, this story starts with, I remember being back home in Waukegan, uh, my hometown again. This time I was a role model. Uh, right after college, I was an assistant principal of my cousin's school, my friend's children's school, and thousands of other middle school students um, in the city. I was hired to be the enforcer or quote unquote law and order administrator. I didn't tolerate disrespect, disruption, selling drugs, or gang activity, so much so that I expelled nearly 25 kids in three years. I was there to clean up the culture of the school, at least that's what I told myself. But that night I kept replaying the Latina grandmother's plea for the board uh, for her Latino grandson's future in my head. I couldn't quite make out what she meant when she said, que he se do se fruto, que he se do se fruto. Uh, while I couldn't make out the translation of her Spanish, I felt the pain in her voice and the helplessness that resided in her demeanor. Her spirit was broken. It was as if it was a, a funeral. On my way out of the board meeting, I asked the interpreter what she said and he explained it meant, what about his future or what is in his future for him? It was a familiar experience my brother had gone through, my mother had gone through with my brother um, when she had the same emotion. Um, my older brother, Gil, was expelled from that same school nearly 14 years to the day. Only this time, I was the judge, a proud, educated Black man issuing a sentence to my Black and Brown students without any regard for their futures. I had become everything I hated about the system and it had impacted and how it impacted my family and my people. As I drove home, things didn't sit well. In fact, I cried. As I wept, I wondered, where would these kids go? What will they do? When will they get back in school? Will they ever graduate? That night I learned, tragically, that fighting, whether physical or intellectual perhaps, has no value for anyone. In order to restore others, particularly Black and Latinx communities, as a leader, I first needed to heal. When I was a kid, I thought power was displayed in my arms, abs and legs. As I left college, I thought power was about outthinking people, and as I sit here today, I believe and know that power is more about vulnerability and humility than anything else. So um, that's what I like kind of talking about through, uh, about what I learned in that particular space. Uh, as many of you may know, just from some of the stuff they talked about in the intro, I spent my career in various school districts in the Chicagoland area, uh, proud of extensing everywhere from Waukegan, East Chicago, Indiana, Harvey, to more recently, um, District 65 in Evanston. Uh, one of the biggest things that I think as a principal I like to talk about is just uh, one of my favorite uh, scholars, if you will, Nelson Mandela. May your choices reflect your hopes, not your fears. So much about life is, is really about whether or not you take your hopes and your dreams seriously. So where I am today and sort of how I stumbled into things was really um, in my stint as a principal in Evanston. I had this complex situation and one of my teachers brought to my, my desk uh, about a week or two into the job where we had a uh, kindergarten student who identified as non-binary, which for those of you who don't know, that means they don't identify as either male or female in terms of gender. Um, I wasn't prepared for that because as a black man who was immersed in a Baptist Christian atmosphere as a kid, I really didn't prepare myself for dealing with that at elementary. I, I thought it would be more of um, a matter that would be approached in middle school or a high school setting. But either way, that was sort of the last phase of where I had to realize, you know, am I, am I a person that's only here to advocate for Black people? Am I a person that's here to only advocate for people of color who are straight? Um, am I here to advocate for people who are only Christian? And that experience helped me understand that, no, 
I'm pro-humanity. Everything, every person, um, regardless of how they identify, sexual orientation, any aspect of that is, is what it was that I was born to do, and I'm here to advocate on behalf of them. I don't get permission to, to have a certain pocket of folks that I, that I connect with. So that helps me center my work in, in the quote that's here to the left by uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, we need leaders not in love with money, but in love with uh, justice, not in love with publicity, but in love with humanity. So that brought me to my work in, in um, pro-humanity. And as, as was talked about in a previous part of the introduction, received uh, a number of awards, most of which I don't think really capture the essence of what it is that I feel that I was called to do, which is really just to make everything about the people in empowerment. I could care less about whether or not I get acknowledged for my work, but I definitely want the people and humanity to be centered and liberated. Um, so as we talked about earlier, all of this was a springboard into my more recent endeavors with my youngest brother, Gilbert, who I, who I raised, uh, who is now working on his doctorate. Um, we, we sort of stumbled into this study in 2019 um, about New York City public schools where they did an analysis of text for people of color. Um, and what they noticed is despite New York City having about 85% or more people of color, uh, the texts that they read were more likely to be from white uh, culture. Um, it, they also ultimately went a bit further and found out that kids of color were reading more books with animals than they were of their own culture. So that kind of sped up the pace that my brother and I had about thinking about what we could do to give back to um, humanity in a sense, but in particular, uh, vulnerable and marginalized people of all kinds. Our story centers our journey, but the point of what we did wasn't to just talk about our, our role as Black men. We were also trying to give people, other vulnerable and marginalized people, permission to tell their authentic story in their own voice um, in a way that could help our community. So that was what was a springboard into our, our equity and empowerment work. And we've kind of been on this journey ever since. It's been uh, since 2020, uh, September 2020, when we uh, published the first book. And we are well on our way to, to having the second one uh, published as well. So. My more recent transition, um, while I spent all of my adult life in public education of some sort as a teacher and an educator, uh, over the last three months, I've transitioned out of public ed into coaching and mentoring principals all over the country, um, writing, um, teaching classes to, to principals and superintendents, and sort of influencing, as we talked about earlier, policy and um, advocating on behalf of vulnerable and marginalized people of all kinds. So, what I like to do is transition into the five key areas of, of things that I think apply to having a holistic life today or peace. Uh, the first area I like talking about is systemic racism. And this picture does a great job of sort of encapsulating what it is that I want to say. When I think about systemic racism, it is all the messages that we receive as a society, all those different images we are given about a given set of people. In this case, this is a young Black boy, but I could Juxtapose, I could change this out and have a Latinx boy or any other person that's a vulnerable group, but in particular from a race perspective. Um, but I'm talking about system of unfair practice or bias or perception about a group of people that's systemic. So they're invested efforts, not just from a person, but a systemic approach to it. Um, I like talking about systemic racism for the biggest reason of equity is sort of the antidote, the antidote to it um, or the way to undermine its value by being able to understand that people deserve what they need. And humanity is centered in approximation to what it looks like to liberate people. Uh, while systemic racism may have roots and a strong foundation, if we as a group of people come together collectively to be able to under, undergird its foundation, I think we can, um, we can take back the things that uh, vulnerable and marginalized people deserve, which is dignity, respect, opportunities, resources, and liberation. Now, on one hand, the reason why I like talking about systemic racism is because Oftentimes vulnerable and marginalized people, but in particular people of color, feel like something's wrong with us. When you think, when you talk about this openly, and I like acknowledging it because it is real, it is true, what you're experiencing is absolutely accurate. But um, the rest of the areas two through five are sort of approaches that I think are holistic to finding homeostasis, balance, or peace. So mindfulness is something my brother and I stumbled into when dealing with what we were dealing with in, in, in the college area for me in high school for him. Um, and by mindfulness, I mean present moment awareness of our thoughts, feelings, and sensations. So being completely immersed in the present. Um, I, I am gonna zoom out here and try to uh, give you LeBron James perspective about it. Hopefully it works, but, um, but in particular, what, what is important to note about mindfulness is 
the idea that um, that we can see the value of being completely present in the in the in the moment. So let's see if it works. Dr. Allen, did you click share audio when you did your screen share? Because we can't hear anything. I was in a good groove. I just knew we could. Um, let me see. If you click screen share and there's a little button on the bottom left to share the audio. Uh, share sound? Yes, That's true. It. Oh, that probably was the issue in the original video, wasn't it? Let's try that. Thank you for that. Hey, this is LeBron James. Good. I'm going to kick this off with something I've worked on a lot in my career, and that's managing emotions. Before you can win the game on the court, you need to win the mental and emotional game in your mind. If you let your emotions take over, you can lose your confidence. You can lose your focus you probably lose the game. As human beings, we're gonna have emotions, getting angry, getting frustrated, getting anxious. It's all a part of what we experience in life. And so are experiences like comfort, excitement, and happiness. I'm not here to say that emotions are a bad thing, but in a lot of situations, your emotions can betray you. They can take you down, in those big moments when there's a lot of pressure on, suddenly you start to get nervous or fearful. You start thinking, can I really do this? You doubt yourself. This is all natural, but it's not helpful. So what I learned is that I need to stay totally focused in the moment. I need to connect with my goal and tune out everything else. So here's how I think about managing my emotions and staying locked in the moment. Take a deep breath. If you think of your mind like a machine, your breath is electricity. It's like a power source for your concentration. If you're under pressure or feeling anxious, deep breathing is a way of telling your mind and your body that everything's cool, nothing to worry about. Even if you got anxious thoughts in your head, you breathe deep and your body calms down. So thank you for in, indulging in one of my favorite uh, athletes of all time, uh, LeBron James, his perspective around mindfulness. Um, if you don't mind, I would like to lead you all through about a 90 second breathing exercise. Wherever you are, if you could just sit up straight in your chair, make sure your back is straight. Have your hands either sitting on your lap or dangling right at your side. Relax your shoulders back and down. I'm gonna ask you to breathe in. Um, and when I say inhale or breathe in, you'll breathe in through your nose, um, you'll hold it, um, and then you'll breathe out through your mouth. Each time I ask you to breathe in, I'll count up one, two, three. I ask you to hold it, and then when I count, when I ask you to breathe out, you'll breathe, I'll count down three, two, one. We'll do that three times before we wrap up. Okay. So we're going to start. Breathe in through your nose. One, two, three. Hold it. Out through your mouth. Three. Two, one, hold it in through your nose. One, two, three, hold it out through your mouth. Three, two, one, hold it. Last time in through your nose. One, two, three, hold it out through your mouth. Three, two, one. Now breathe normally. What I want you to do is take a moment to notice how you feel. 
as you can see, most of the time, the, the only question I like asking after a quick uh, 90 second activity is, do you feel worse? No one ever feels worse. Uh, this is a very powerful um, approach to life that um, has transformed my ability to respond to conflict and so many different other areas of my life. And, and it's one of the reasons why I indulge in it uh, so regularly. Um, the third area that I think is really, really important and it's been very valuable to my development as well as my brothers is the, the, the power of mentorship. So trusted adults that typically have gone through where it is you're trying to go in life um, that can really show you um, in, in a guided, methodical way how to get to where you're trying to go practically. Oftentimes, uh, folks who are the first to do things or trying to do something different than other people in your family don't quite have uh, people who can support you in making that real and practical. The point of a mentor is to be able to do that for us. Um, and, and this is something I think is really, really valuable to kind of talk through in this space. Um, the fourth area that I think is really, really important is mental health. Um, and that is therapy. So when I, when I speak about mental health, the value of being able to proactively talk about different things that are going on in my family, we battle depression. Um, so the idea of how depression impacts us has, has been something that my brother and I have invested in for quite some time. Um, I'm, I'm literally about nine years into to going to therapy, mainly just to be able to see it as a proactive approach to life. I look at it as just like I exercise, just like I wanna control my diet, proactivity, in terms of being able to situate the things that one has been exposed to, and all of us, regardless of background, have been exposed to some form of trauma that we need to be able to have um, some sense of peace with in order to be able to show up as the most pure and authentic version of ourselves. So mental health, uh, when I reference that, I am talking about therapy and the value of that in a proactive sense. And the final piece is the power of, of vulnerability. Um, this is one of the favorites that Gilbert and I like talking through, but by vulnerability, we're talking about the bold and courageous act to give yourself permission to show up as the purest and authentic version of yourself. As a, Even though I saw myself for years as, as a strong physical athlete, I am a person who has emotions too. So it's okay for me when I need to express myself in the form of tears. It's okay for me to express myself when there's anger, um, but vulnerability is the bold and courageous act to be able to show up as the pure and most authentic version of yourself. Um, and give yourself permission to experience all the different emotions that your body has in a given set of experiences. So as I start to wind down, I sort of like talking through the lessons, the, you know, my profound things that I feel like I've been able to uncover along the way in my journey. Um, and, and they're sort of our undergirded in this particular, these particular order. Uh, number one, I think it's important to rely on wisdom over insecurities of intellect. Uh, two, it's really, really important for us to heal and forgive ourselves so that we can empower others. Oftentimes, we blame ourselves about the things that we've gone through in life. Healing is invaluable to growth and development. We need to, as human beings, find humanity in everything and everyone. Uh, we need to feed our mind, our body, and our soul regularly. Um, in addition, I think we should surround ourselves with people who can lovingly hold us accountable. Um, that's really, really important. People who can give you information that may uh, be hurtful at some point in time in terms of the inconvenience, but can hold you accountable in a loving way. Uh, submitting to something greater is the single most revolutionary decision one can take. Understanding there's a larger plan for your life is what I mean when I say greater. Um, and then um, understanding, accepting, and becoming accountable for your growth before assessing. So in a leadership capacity, understand that before you can truly assess another person, you have to be accountable for their growth. So this is not just about you, but the other people. Um, and then finally, um, bringing it back to mindfulness. Be here now, uh, so present in the moment that you can feel the pulse of your legacy. In it. There we go. So at this point, what I would like to do is transition into the Q&A portion of our time together. Um, I believe that there's some, some folks who are going to assist with that. Thank you so much. I, I've got pages and notes once again from your, uh, and I love the book. And so I, I can't thank you enough for your words of inspiration. Let's get to some questions. Jeremy, you are up first. All right, Mr. Allen. Uh, my first question for you is, what significant aspect of your background empowered you to value family and education? That's a tough question. What significant aspect of my lifestyle my life um, empowered me to, to 
value family and education? Got it. Okay. That's like a trick question. I would say, to be completely frank, my mother. So my mother, despite her battling uh, drug addiction, uh, when I was young, she just poured so much love and affirmation into me when I was uh, when probably before five years old. Uh, so between, I can recall memories at four or five and six, but she always stressed the value of education, but more importantly, she stressed the value of dreaming big. And then she held me and my siblings accountable for protecting and understanding the importance of family. So, um, so much of the love that she provided for me, the clarity, the support and the affirmation is what allowed me to be able to find my way in life and, and my purpose of, of, of education and, and not losing sight of family in the, in the process. So, does that make sense? Thank you. No problem. Thank you both. Kevin, you are up next. Hi, wait, okay. You guys see me? Okay, yes. so I want to start off by saying your message was truly enlightening as well as your story that was very inspirational. But my question is, for high school students such as me, what would you tell them right now? Ooh, um, well, first of all, I would say this. I usually get to say this when I'm when my book, my brother and I are together in school in these spaces. Number one, um, I want to say this to both to you and Jeremy, but anyone else who's on the call. I know I don't know you. I, I can see your name, Heaven, but but I love you. Um, you are a perfect manifestation of everything that our ancestors have sacrificed. And I see your future. I see it so bright. I see uh, so much special uh, things inside of you, everything from brilliance to beauty. Um, but I need you to know that because that's, that's something I struggle with for so much of my life is realizing because of my father's absence that I, I felt that I wasn't lovable. And there weren't enough people unapologetically telling me that. Um, but since I found that for myself, I think the biggest thing that you need to know um, in high school is that you are loved. People are expecting for you to do some great stuff and you, nothing can stop. So I think oftentimes I talked about systemic racism and I want you to, to see that particularly as a, as a black brilliant woman um, is that nothing can stop you from becoming what it is you were created for. Um, never let any person, um, even if they're family members, de uh, de um, say stuff that's going to make you start to question your, your true gift. Stay focused. Uh, do what it is you were born to do, and don't be afraid to dream outside the box. Um, I can tell that you're going to do some amazing stuff. I hope you. Uh, I hope I say something where you remind you. You can bring up my name one day, so I can feel like I had an influence on it. But, but uh, thank you so much for that question. I really appreciate it. Did yes. I answer it all? Yes. Yes, you did. <laughs> Thank you, Heaven. Stacy, you're up next. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Allen. I've really enjoyed your presentation. Um, just my question is, is going back to the idea of mental health and mindfulness within our community. Uh, you know, I think most of us were raised with what goes on in this house stays in this house. And there's a fear of being able to share uh, like you spoke to that trauma that a lot of us have endured um, as children, uh, young adults uh, growing up with others who aren't within our circle. Um, how have you been able to one, overcome that for yourself, but two, share that, that, uh, that opportunity with others to really uh, explore that option? Listen, it's been a journey. Um, here's, here's one thing though that I didn't talk about that I think has undergirded this particular part of my life. It's a mantra that I live by. Uh, you have to be willing to risk who you are for what you hope to become. You have to be willing to risk who you are for what you hope to become. <laughs> so my mom planted this seed when I was young to dream, right? And I took her serious. Uh, some people don't necessarily take their parents serious, but this idea of understanding there was a world beyond our community that had a place for me. And so what I realized, and that's what I try to capture in the three short stories that I talk about is that um, my mental health was tricking me into thinking that things were real that really weren't. Um, and mental health can affect us even when we're in a sort of seemingly rational state. Here I am in the pinnacle of my life, having an opportunity with people that entrust in their, their, young, their most precious resource, their children with me, and I'm throwing my people away. That in part connected back to not just the system, right, of systemic racism, but also my own mental illness, the lack of consciousness as to what it was that I thought I was given. I can talk to heaven, I can talk to Jeremy, I can talk to whoever today and speak the language of love. But then I was speaking the language of restrictions, isolation, uh, rejection. And that's not, that's not who 
I am in my most healthy state. So, so much of what I aspire to have, and I think is, is important in our community, especially when we trace it back thousands of years. Like we had a history before America um, that really has an impact on how we center ourselves today. And we're not proximate to understanding the, the responsibility that comes with that. So for me, my goal is always to, to be able to act from a place of balance, uh, homeostasis. And that to me is often rooted in direct love. But it took a while to get there. I, I think I almost had to risk my life, like my future, before I started to say, okay, I'm feeling all these big emotions and conversations with people who are not even that important to me. And what's going on? And I realized I was being tricked, whether it been at work, um, in situations where there were microaggressions or overt racism, and I'm being triggered back to things when I was a kid. And so that sort of allowed me about nine years ago to understand the value of of, uh, of, of going into therapy. And, and for me, it wasn't just about, I, I never necessarily recognized, and I don't feel like it's something wrong with us, people. I think therapy is not really for people who have problems. Therapy is like exercise for the soul. <laughs> it's proactive exercise for the soul. So you don't need to wait till you lose a loved one. You don't need to wait until you have some catastrophic situation in life. You need to go now because it's, it just centers all the other areas. So I have a health coach, a therapist. I have uh, mentors in all the different facets of my life. And therapy is just like the rest of those other pieces that are necessary. So I don't know that the trauma that I endured was, was as much as what I found valuable about therapy as it is to, to live a holistic, balanced, functional, healthy life. You have to look at all the different areas of your life and evaluate it and have a plan that's going to allow you to capitalize. And so that's the way I looked at um, therapy. It, it's been a journey, though, because, again, when you grow up with extreme trauma, people want to tell your story for you. I think it's important to know for me, and I'll wrap up with this, with this piece, is the most traumatic things I've ever experienced in my life have come after I went away to college, not when I was a child. The fact that as a Black man with a doctorate degree, people still don't think I belong. Uh, people don't understand that I've had to almost be perfect to get to where I am today, and yet people still don't treat me and see me the way that I, I feel like I deserve. And that, that's the trauma that many people of, of color and other vulnerable and marginalized groups are dealing with and trying to carry every day, not just simply the traumatic extreme things that we may have endured as children. So. Thank you. No problem. I'm gonna, I'm gonna build off of that question. How do you deal with that frustration um, that, that, that of, of the high standard, the extraordinary high standard that you're expected to live up to? Uh, to me, it's, you know, it's easier said than done in some respects. It depends on if you had asked me five years ago, I probably had a different response. For me, having had to go through so much recent trauma, so both my parents transitioned over the last 12, years, 12 months, um, I think what I started to do is I set my own bar. So I stopped, I stopped competing in this pull yourself by the bootstrap, the mentality that doesn't really have a place for people who come from a different world. And I just started to set my own metrics as to what peace, joy, and happiness looks like for me. Um, so I'm not defined by what I accomplish. I'm defined by who I empower. And that's ultimately based upon my own understanding of what it was I was created for. So the more that I started to remove myself, remove the pressure and stress from society and other people, uh, from, from how I looked at myself day in and day out, I feel like I found more peace and gratification into what it is that I'm able to do. It takes time. Though. So this is sort of like access in the highest level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. The more that you stabilize some of those foundational things in your life, you can access a deeper level of yourself, a deeper consciousness, if you will. But it does, you know, it's hard to break free from the messages of the church, right? It's hard to break free from the messages of your family. It's hard to break free from the messages of, of society. But the moment that you can start to realize that you are bigger than all of that, you're created to do more than what other people think about you, I think it gives you a certain consciousness to, to find your own path, to set your own standards, to make sure you're good with what you do or don't do and not look for the approval of others. Because I think it can, make, it can become toxic for you and unhealthy. There's a question for you, Dr. Allen, from uh, the president of the Fuse organization, Kim Thomas. How can parents help their children of color see their leadership potential and abilities? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. I would say, I think the most important thing that I think we need to do in, in communities of color 
I, and I tried to, you know, I wasn't doing it to act. It really just who, is who I am. Um, but whether it's like heaven or it's my nieces um, or my or my daughter or daughters, you know, like um, as often as we get, I, and I'm not just limiting this to gender. Like so, so for young for for boys and, and folks who identify as non-binary, tell our communities that we love them, love on them a lot more. I think is the most important piece. Um, give these radical acts of affirmation um, to, to be able to talk about the brilliance of them because you can see it leaking out of these young people. Like, yeah, I don't I don't need to like sit down and interview Heaven and Jeremy to see like they are going places and they're getting ready to change the world. And so they need to know that because they can, if they're ever questioning if they have our faces and our voices in their heads to be able to encourage them in those moments. Um, that's the biggest thing I would say off, off, the, off the top of my head. The other things I would say is Make sure that we're careful not to subscribe to a standard sometimes in society that doesn't necessarily have a place for us. So don't, I'm an advocate for education, right? But I'm more of an advocate for people being able to find out who they are. So if your journey in life doesn't take you down a traditional path of going to a four-year university and doing all these other things, give the young people permission to be able to be the best version of themselves and, um, and expect excellence, but not necessarily a linear path towards whatever it is that you may decide for them. Um, learn to let them know that they deserve to be loved and they should be treated with respect and dignity and you'll support them no matter what they'll do. Uh, no matter what decisions they make in life, our love won't change, right? Uh, but I think those are the most important things. Of course, I could talk about the academics and all the specific strategic things that I'm sure you're hearing about in schools, but I think what we're not hearing enough about in communities of color is the importance of affirmation, collective support, love, and, and healing. So being able to act from a healing space as opposed to a, a space of, um, of not being reconciled, I think can have an impact on, on the young people who are looking up to us. And also the final thing I would say to parents that we don't take advantage of enough, go live your dream now. Because when you do, it gives your children permission to do that. That doesn't mean it'll happen overnight, but take the first step. And then after you get the first step together, take the second step. Because the more that you are living a uh, living manifestation of it, of what it is you're pushing them to do, it'll make it much more proximate for them to be able to figure out what it looks like. Um, so those are the biggest things I would say that we can do um, in communities of color. Of course, I'm an advocate for you change the world and you change your family through changing you. So I need to heal. And when I heal, it gives all the people around me permission to understand the value of doing that for themselves. So I can push my my closest friends to go to therapy. You know why? Because I've been in for nine months, nine years. And so um, I think that's the best place to kind of start with is to start with you and then you'll see the people around you, including the youth, uh, come on board. Beautiful, beautiful. Jeremy's got uh, another question that he, he wants to come back and ask you. Not our last question, but a question. Okay, come on. <laughs> our next question for you, Mr. Allen is, it's clear that there's a lot of adversity in your life. And let me say that I've also experienced a lot of adversity growing up, so I can empathize with you in regards to all the struggles and challenges that you went through in your upbringing, especially as a person of color. So my question for you is, can you leave us with some words of encouragement for students that are suffering now? Mm. Mm. Listen, thank you. for First of all, thank you for being transparent and vulnerable with, uh, with what you shared. I think here's what I would say. If there's a plan for a person who repeated preschool, um, was afraid to talk in front of people, um, had parents who battled drug addiction for almost 30 years, um, had spent nights, many, many nights without water, lights, um, and dealt with some of the most traumatic things that one can, can do. If I can actually make it to where I am today, to, to be the first in my family to go away to college, to get a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, a doctorate, um, to be able to afford to eat whatever I wanna eat, to travel wherever I wanna travel, to live wherever I wanna live, um, and to travel around the world today, right now, literally as I'm talking to each of you, this is my dream. Um, if there's a place for me to come from where I come from and be where I am today, there is, there's place for you as well. Um, your hopes and dreams are as real as you take them. Uh, but I think that what's tremendously difficult sometimes to understand is your imagination is the birthplace of creativity. Now you have to wake up and get out into the world and put it into action. You have to be willing to risk 
who you are or how you see yourself and be able to find people who can push you to the next level. But don't be afraid to keep stepping out there. I think the greatest thing that each of each of the young people who I've been able to, to see and talk to today that you all share that I think mirrors me is you feel fear, but you're still not afraid to take the step. So feel it, but do what you need to do anyway. And what you'll find out on the other side is that it was worth it. Um, the reality is the people, look, the critics are going to be there, whether you do or don't do something. Decide when you look in the mirror every morning and every day uh, what it is that you want to live with about your life. Perfection is not real. Just be you. There's only one version of you. So that would probably be my words of encouragement in this space. Thank you. My pleasure. Can you, can we go back for a minute. You're in college and you're it, it, hard work and you're playing football and your brother gives you a call. Take us back to that time. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was, it was an interesting time period. Thank you, Gilda. Uh, I would say, Gilbert and I talk about this one regularly uh, all over. So the truth is that I was calling home, at least the way I recall it, um, I was calling home to brag. So I was living in the flow. I had just found myself. I was enjoying the social scene. And my football team was about a week away from playing in the championship game. So we were getting ready to get a ring. And I was, of course, trying to talk to two of my younger brothers and, and basically brag. Um, and what, what happened is my sister gave me a context of what was going on with Gilbert. And, and sort of when I talked to him, he started to cry immediately. He was bawling. So um, I was broken, to be honest with you. I, I felt bad that I, I dealt with something that I call um, survivor's remorse or survivor's guilt. So I, I, I was feeling bad about how great my world was. And I knew my people and my family were back home struggling. So I, I'm eating whatever I want to eat. We're traveling all over the country. And, and, and for the first time, I felt like I started to realize that there was something bigger than me in this journey. And, and I think I sort of haphazardly said, to Gilbert, if things don't get better, I'll come get you. I wasn't as serious as I was that I wanted his pain. I wanted to stop his pain in that moment. Um, but it was, it was really a tough experience because, because of how long Gilbert, how young Gilbert was, I never really seen him cry. Um, and so to feel him crying as, as a teenager uh, really, really took me to a place that, that I think activated a different instinct in me that I don't know that I had before that moment. Um, but, uh, but I definitely was broken, but, um, but inspired at the same time. And I'm just grateful that he was courageous enough to actually tell me that. So many young people are going through what Gilbert was going through and then they don't talk to the people who could potentially make a difference in their future. So I knew he was courageous to, to tell me I had to equally meet his, his, uh, his actions with something that, that would empower him. So that was pretty much what was going on in my mind at the time um, when I was first informed of that. You know, I have one of my favorite expressions, Dr. Ellen, is he who saves one life saves the world entire. That's mm -hmm. what you do. Yeah. Heaven. I see. I see heaven. You want to, uh, are you going to unmute or you want me to read? Come on screen. Yeah. Okay. Can you see me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. My question is for anybody struggling with like self-esteem issues, what affirmations can you give them to say daily? Because I feel like affirmations like I am strong is pretty cliche. So what are some detailed affirmations that somebody can live by? You got it. You need to write a book on it, haven't I? Hope. <laughs> um, let me see. So I would say, I, I like, I would tell young people to, you're already on your phone, type in some inspirational um, or some language about whatever it is you're feeling in that moment in YouTube, and you'll see tons of inspirational videos come up that'll be forms of affirmation. Um, I, though, let me, there's a couple of people who are really, Lon Drell um, is, is, is sort of an affirming, um, he's a rapper, but I feel like his music resonates with, with folks. Um, a couple of my, my, my um, mentees have put me on his music. But it's sort of, it's not just the same repeated, repetitive. I think what you're saying, like, I am smart, I'm strong, all those different things. It's not so much that they cliche, it's that it's the same stuff over and over again. And it's not necessarily an inspirational, creative message. Uh, so Londrell is his name. L, I'll drop it in the chat. That's one I would prefer. 
I would refer you directly to. Um, other things I would say is if you could, a lot of times for years, I found myself um, actually just typing different things that I was struggling with in that moment. So let's just say, um, what does it mean to feel unlovable? Like I would type that question into, into YouTube. I would type it into Google sometimes. And the more that I did, um, what I found is I started to, to trace back and own. The biggest exercise I like, and I would want to push you to do this uh, as soon as you can, have, um, is when you're in the mirror sometimes, ask yourself, who are you? And then ask yourself, how do you know? Um, and then finally ask yourself, what does that mean? Who am I? How do I know? And then what does that mean? Um, what I'm particularly hopeful that, that you will address from this is, you know, the, firm, the affirmation is one piece, right? The idea of like being able to have a statement that can empower you. But another piece would be to start to push yourself to say, look, people actually made sacrifices for me. Um, and whatever doubts I'm having, it's because of some other adult who didn't get what they needed. And so they, they've given me doubt and fear. So how can I neutralize that or minimize the effect it's having on my ability to be the best version of myself? And I think what you'll start to see is you'll start to put yourself in situations where your mind is being furnished with things that are keeping you focused. That's going to have a consequence on the people you hang around. So you won't have to worry about certain things. You'll start to get much more annoyed with things that are not pushing you forward and people who are bringing that to the table. And then you'll start to get crystal clear about what your next step is. So that's what it is. To me, I feel like it's not just affirmations in terms of thoughts, it's affirmations in terms of lifestyle. So I, I am doing what I knew I was going to do about 16 months ago, and I expected it. And, I, and I'm not going to stop here. There's something else I'm going to do in the next 16 months. But a lot of it started with what I put in my mind and then starting to create the conditions in my lifestyle to fit that and then being ready, right? All right. Check out, so check out Lines Real, though. You'll definitely like... Um, he has he has music on uh, Spotify and I have mine from on Apple. Um, but check him out. It's, it's a lot of soothing, um, affirmative music. And I think it's also some of the stuff that I like calling like momentology, which is stuff to get your mind right in the morning and get you off to a good day. Okay. Right. Thank you. Okay. No problem. We're going to take one last question. Um, you talked so much and so beautifully about how important it is for parents to be there to love on them, respect on them, um, and be there for them. Um, we know, and you also alluded to how important it is for a parent to be in a good place themselves and get themselves well to be there for their children. Can you say um, some parting words about that to our parents tonight? Sure. Um, <clears throat> Well, here's what I will say. One of the most uh, eye-opening things that ever happened to me as a principal was when I started to recognize that all families were the same. So uh, parents who were coming in, single parent moms who were like, you know, busting their butts to be able to provide a better opportunity for their kids are really sending us their best versions of their kids every single day. Um, and they're no less no less than, than, than folks who, who have, uh, you know, tremendous privilege and, and wealth. Um, it's important, but, but, but oftentimes vulnerable and marginalized people, in particular people of color, don't realize it. You are already doing a great job. You're doing as great of a job as anyone else. Everything that I'm actually advising in this space in terms of therapy, mindfulness, is needed in the richest households in the country, perhaps more than in your household. So never undervalue what it is that you bring to the table and the gift. There was no better parent for me than my mother. She was the only person that could get me to understand who I needed to be in my life. And I'm tremendously grateful for that. I do not wish that I had a parent who did all these other things and went to college. I wish that I had the parent that I had. And so it's important for you to not undervalue the brilliance that you're bringing to the table that's being able to allow your student to develop. So don't underplay that. Um, you don't have to sacrifice your dreams in order for your kids to be able to live theirs. You can start your living your dream too. You don't have to put everything on hold. I'm not saying stop providing for your family, but I'm saying think about what your dream is and what's the first step to it. 
and take that step and then maybe the next step. Um, but the most powerful uh, weapon that I think you have as a parent, and you're probably already using it, is that love is inside of you. That's what will allow your, your uh, child to be able to understand how to transform the world and to be able to, to do something that's, that's special is, is the love that's in the household. Um, it's not as complicated as it seems, but be present, um, be the best, try to be the best version of yourself and don't undervalue what's already powerful for your, for your kid because it is already um, having a tremendous impact on who they are and what they're becoming. And you are not more, you are not any less important than other people who have more money. Um, in fact, I'm finding that many of the people of color are coming to the table and having more holistic structures in place than people with the privilege. We all have to, we all have work. That's, that's the reality of it, and that's okay. But you're not alone. There's not something wrong with you. Keep doing what you're doing. Um, and don't be afraid to ask for help when you need it, because part of the responsibility of the schools is to be able to meet you wherever you are and do our best to, to, to empower you. Help is available. You're not alone. Your words were so beautiful. Just the talk for the times, Dr. Allen. I can't, worth waiting for, for these two years that we can finally <laughs> make it happen. Uh, I hope everybody will come back next Tuesday. We're going to continue this inspirational message. It's going to be here again next Tuesday from Julie Lykoff Hames. So please circle your calendar and share. And Dr. Allen and Stacy and Jeremy and Heaven, um, can't thank you enough. And everyone listening, um, you really left us with some wise words and we couldn't be more grateful. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you so much, uh, Gilda, um, Heaven. Jeremy, Stacy, it's been a tremendous honor to be with you in the entire community. You all are doing some really amazing work. I think you're trailblazers in this world. Keep it up. I'm just glad that I can be able to, to support you in your endeavors. Dr. Allen, thank you again also for sharing, letting us share this. So this will be on our Glenbar YouTube channel for anyone who wants to share it beyond uh, those that were able to listen in tonight. So I thank you for that. Very generous of you. And we'll My have pleasure. you back. All right. Yes. All right. All right. You all take care.